I'm Rebecca West. I am here to present to you the presentation, Nail Your Niche, Get More and Better Clients. Let's dive into this. So for those of you who have never met me before, I'm Rebecca. For the last 15 years, I ran a residential interior design firm called Seriously Happy Homes in Seattle, Washington. And now I live in Paris and I spend all of my time helping other designers to nail their niche. And that's both their design niche and their business niche because we need to have it. I'll go into that in a second. We have to establish clear client expectations, which I teach through my lead to launch course. And we need to teach our clients how to make quick, confident design decisions, which I teach through my decide webinar series. So that's who I am. Now, before I go into the details, for those of you who are there, you know that I give away a one-to-one -one business coaching session anytime I do a live presentation. That has closed. You can't enter to win for that anymore. However, I am still happy to send anybody who wants it my Nail Your Niche Starter Kit. So to get that starter kit, all you need to do after this presentation is email me with your favorite aha moment so that I know what you're taking away from my presentations. So you can email that to me at Rebecca at SeriouslyHappy.com and I will send you the Nail Your Niche Starter Kit. So let's dive in. My job in this presentation is to bust a few myths about what it means to actually choose a niche and to give you a new way to think about embracing a niche so that you can actually have the success that I know having a niche will give you. So we're going to start today with a question. This was one that would have made a little bit more sense in the context of being in the room live. But the question is simply this. When you go to a networking event of any kind, how well do you know the people in the room? And I would say for a lot of us, we've got a lot of colleague acquaintances and a lot of colleague friends, but we wouldn't necessarily to confidently tell anybody else what our colleagues do, who they do it for, or what we would get if we actually were to hire them as a client. Now, that's probably fine because it's not your job to actually refer out your colleagues. However, the more important question is, could you confidently tell me what you do, who you do it for, and what I would get if I hired you? It's really important that we're both very clear about this for ourselves and also that we're able to articulate that so that people understand what we do and who we do it for. Sometimes it's unclear in our own minds, which is going to make it impossible to describe to other people. And sometimes it's clear in our minds, but we haven't had a chance to really get our words around it so that the people who need to know what we do and who we do it for know it. So all of the stuff that I'm talking about here, this is the foundation of a niche. We try to overcomplicate it, but it really comes down to the things that distinguish us from one another and help clients know who they should hire. That's all a niche is. Are you at the right design party or should you leave this design party and go to another one? Because every single one of our clients has a certain kind of obstacle and a certain kind of design dream. And we want to make sure that they are coming to the right designer to get those results, those ones that they're hoping for. So here's how I see a niche. I do not believe that it is about convincing somebody that they need biophilia or minimalism or tiny house design or dopamine design, which is my current favorite to look at on Instagram. It's not about convincing them they need anything. It's actually the opposite. It's about finding the people who already want what you help create and don't have the resources to create it on their own. And what do I mean by resources? I do not just mean money. We usually just think of resources in terms of money, but money is rarely the main obstacle keeping us from what we want in life. It is one obstacle, but it is not the only one and is not the main one. So your job as a designer is to swoop in with the right skills and the right design process and the right design deliverables and hopefully a love of the same aesthetics. And then like, boom, you're a freaking superhero, which is awesome because that is when our clients love and trust us and let our, us do our best work for them. So do you have what it takes to be a design superhero? It takes three important ingredients, but I honestly believe we all have these ingredients. We might just not be aware of them. 
So the first is, do you have a design point of view? And by design point of view, I'm not talking about your aesthetic point of view. I'm talking about the fundamental foundation of why you design what you design. So I believe that every single one of us creates certain kinds of spaces and we have a personal design philosophy that goes beyond the aesthetics. So for example, for me, I really preferred working on small, cozy spaces, homes that were 3,000 square feet and under, which in my opinion is still quite large. But some of my colleagues really excel at designing for these grand, huge mansions. We want to get clear on that. That's not necessarily an aesthetic point of view because I could do the same design style in either of those spaces. Or for example, your design point of view might be that you're really focusing on the luxury high-end market or that you're focusing on the mid-market or the affordable market. Again, you could execute the same aesthetic point of view with any of these markets. So that isn't your design point of view. Your design point of view is who are you helping create what kind of spaces? Same thing would apply if we're talking about eco-friendly, sustainable sourcing, or easy care, practical, low maintenance sourcing, or one of a kind bespoke custom sourcing. All of these things inform how you do what you do for your clients and why you do what you do for your clients. And like I said, they could cross all kinds of different aesthetic barriers. This is about your design point of view. So do you have a, so that's number one. Second, you need to have a design process point of view. So you've got your design point of view. What kind of spaces are we creating separate from aesthetics? But then how are we helping our clients get there? What is the journey that they will actually experience going from where you guys start to where you guys finish? And where you guys finish will vary for each designer. Each of us will have a different finish point. At Seriously Happy Homes, our entire focus was on being a design-only firm. That meant that we created very detailed, completely executable design files, but we handed those to our clients to then take and execute on their own or with a contractor. So our process was very quick, very efficient. It was design-only, and that was the design process people could expect from us. And if people couldn't make quick, confident decisions, our process probably wasn't the right fit for them. So everybody watching offers a particular kind of design journey and a certain set of deliverables. You want to get very clear on what that journey is and what those deliverables are because that will elevate your client's trust in your expertise and again, allow you to do your very best work for them. So for example, do you design fast or slow? Do you give your clients a lot of time to process and think and digest? Or do you expect them to be pretty good decision makers or you have the tools to help them be very good decision makers? Do you offer ideas only? Are you giving them fully executable design plans or are you doing white glove full execution services? Any of those can fit almost any market. So you get to decide what your deliverables are going to be, where your service starts and stops. Are you flat fee or are you hourly? That's a distinguisher. It might not be the thing that makes somebody hire or not hire us, but I will tell you that by being a flat fee firm at Seriously Happy Homes, it made our sales much easier because our clients were very excited to know that they knew exactly what they'd be investing in the design process and not kind of wondering when the next hourly bill was going to roll in. There is a hourly is totally fine. Again, we have to make intentional decisions for our customers, our company, our brand and our well-being and peace of mind. I went flat fee, which makes sales easier, but I did it because I tried hourly for a while and the amount of anxiety that I caused for both me and for my clients and having to send what I considered surprise bills, I hated every minute of it. So I went to flat fee, helped with my sales process, but really it was for my own anxiety levels that I made that decision and stayed firm to it. Are you more collaborative or are you doing most of your design work behind the scenes? That's a huge distinguisher that fits different tribes of people depending on what their needs and their time resources are. 
And do you source to the trade or do you source retail? Again, a very big distinguisher. You might do a combination of those things, but get clear on what you're offering and who you're offering it to and make sure that the services you're offering align with the exact kind of obstacles that the people in your tribe face. So you have to have a design point of view and a design process point of view, and then you want to have that aesthetic point of view. We all have an aesthetic point of view. Some of us, myself included, call ourselves design chameleons because we really feel that it's important that the design is sparked by what the client wants. But over the years, I discovered that even I have an aesthetic point of view. I started noticing that there were consistencies in the designs that I would create. And so we never can truly extricate ourselves from the design aesthetic as designers. We're going to show up in the design, which is good as long as we're clear about what our aesthetic point of view is and we showcase that in some way to our clients so that we don't work on projects that aren't a fit for our best skills. So are you more maximalist or more minimalist? Are you more neutral or more colorful? Maybe you have a a classic design style, mid-century modern or farmhouse or vintage. Do you prefer clean lines and color blocking or do do you a lot of curvy, complicated, carved features or do you layer a lot of patterns, right? All of these things are going to become consistencies within your aesthetic point of view. And if you're not sure, start paying attention. So if you identify that right design point of view, that right design process point of view, and you bring a passion for the same aesthetic point of view as your clients need based on where they're at in their life and what kind of project they're trying to take on, then you can in fact be their design hero, which feels amazing. So the point here is that a niche is so much more than your design style. A lot of times people just think it just means that I'm farmhouse or it just means that I do kitchen and bath. And honestly, your aesthetic point of view and even the rooms you work on are a tiny, tiny piece of what your niche actually is. Most importantly though, I promise that embracing a niche is not limiting and I'll prove that to you in a second. So when I look around rooms full of experts, full of designers, I do see a room full of experts. The problem is while some of my colleagues are very well-known experts and they are hired to do the thing they are great at, And some of my colleagues are obviously like baby experts. They haven't completely figured out what they're an expert in and they're figuring it out. Too many of us are what I like to call secret experts. And that's where we are incredibly good at our jobs, but we have not gotten good at telling people what we do and who we do it for. Really, what we're talking about is the classic elevator speech. If somebody blindsides you with that question, is all that stumbles out of your mouth, I'm an interior designer? Or are you able to draw them into, like invite them into your design party so that they know whether or not they want to show up to it? The way being a secret expert often shows up is that I'm seeing generic taglines on websites. This is one of the early clues that I look for when I'm working with a new designer is could I literally copy and paste everything on their website, all those words to another designer's site and nobody would know that that it happened. And way too often taking out the names, obviously of the company and the designer, we all look exactly the same. And it, one of the places, like I said, is in the tagline. So we've all seen these taglines like transforming spaces, elevating lives, where dreams meet design, crafting homes, creating memories, your vision, our expertise, and designing tomorrow's homes today. So I got these from ChatGPT. I just said, what are very common interior design taglines? And I am sure all of you have seen these sprinkled across maybe yours and certainly your colleagues' websites. The problem is they don't tell us anything 
about the companies. This is wasted website real estate. And we don't want people wasting the real estate in their real homes, right? We want to give them functional rooms that they use because real real estate is very expensive. Well, internet real estate is also very expensive, not necessarily in the actual price tag, but in the fact that you only have a second to catch somebody's eyeballs and make them stick. And if you didn't have a wonderful sigh of relief, compelling message the moment they landed, unless they know you personally or they were referred to you personally, they may not stick around very long on your website, despite all the work you just did to get them to land here in the first place. What we're talking about here is the generalist trap. The generalist trap is one that just too many business people in general fall into. So sorry, the generalist trap, it is, it usually shows up as I can help anyone do anything. All right. We hear this all the time and sure, maybe it's actually true. But as I liked to remind people, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. And the problem when we try to do everything for everyone, it means that we are probably not an expert at anything, or if we are, nobody knows it. We probably feel very stretched thin, especially when it comes to our marketing, because we are just throwing spaghetti at 18 different walls. It's not even just at one wall. We don't get paid as an expert. We may ha hate half the things that we sign up to do. And like I alluded to earlier, we very frequently struggle with our marketing when we are trapped in the generalist trap. You are a lot more likely, you are a lot more likely to land great clients if you make a clear promise to a defined tribe. So think about your background expertise. There are things that you are good at that I am not good at. There are things that you have done or experienced that I have not done or experienced. That's where this stuff starts getting really exciting. So for example, some of you might have a couple's coaching background or a time-saving system or a cost savings approach or preservation expertise. This is the concrete, hard, juicy stuff that people will want to hire you for because it's the thing that sets you apart from your colleagues and makes you good at the specific thing they need you to be good at. This is what you can start to talk about in your marketing and have a compelling marketing message. I saw on, it might have been on LinkedIn or something recently, some article that said self-promotion doesn't work. And I totally agree with that. And this is great news, especially for those of us who are a little bit more introverted because we don't want to self promote, but the great news is we don't have to, we are not promoting ourselves. We are promoting our skills. We are promoting our expertise. We are promoting the thing that we can do for people that helps them accomplish a goal they have for themselves. So that's what you can talk about in your marketing. And then you want to align that with a tribe of people that will really benefit from it. So for example, if you have a couple's coaching background, that might be amazing for empty nest couples. If you have a time saving system, that might be amazing for middle aged urban executives like myself. <laughs> if you have a cost savings approach, Maybe that's perfect for growing families. And if you have a preservation expertise, well, obviously that's going to be a great fit for historic homeowners. And by the way, you will want to further define what a historic home is. Nowadays, even a mid-century modern home could be put into the historic home category. So this is who you can talk to in your marketing. So we decided, we talked about what you can talk about in your marketing, which is your unique expertise and then who you're talking to ideally should be a tribe of people who will really benefit from your unique background and experience. From there, you still get to make some niche decisions. You get to decide if you're going to offer people your ideas, your plans or full execution. This is when we start getting into your services, right? So it's really important that when we're, when we're defining our niche, we define it based off of our best skills. 
And too often as interior designers, we feel like we're supposed to do everything for everybody, but then we're not an expert. Some of us are well suited to giving people on demand advice, like just ideas, or like myself, you're so far into your career that you're kind of tired of doing full designs and you're ready to just offer people a little bit of guidance and move on. So there is a market for this. You can also offer full design only plans. That's what we made our bread and butter at Seriously Happy Homes for 15 years. There is in fact an entire market for people who just need a fully executable roadmap. And then you've got your traditional full execution, white glove delivery. There is a huge... Okay, quick pause. There's a cat in my little screen here because if you're wondering why I was distracted, it's Murray's fault. So say hi, Murray, and then let's get back to this. So there's a huge traditional market for full execution, white glove delivery, and remember, you should be paid very well for that. Think of all the stress and time and hassle you are saving your clients from. It's so much stress and time and hassle that at Seriously Happy Homes, I chose not to deliver that. I chose not to be paid for that rather than take on all the hassle that goes with full execution. So you can do ideas, plans, full execution, any combination thereof. Just get clear on what you're good at and offer services that align with your best and most detailed skills. Once you get really clear on all of this niche stuff, it's surprisingly easy to put together some sort of an elevator speech with clarity that sets you apart from your colleagues. So putting a random one together from the previous examples, let's say you could say, I'm an interior designer when somebody asks what you do. Then you quickly follow up with interesting information that distinguishes you like, I have a background in couples counseling and expertise in historic preservation. So I help empty nesters with historic homes create executable design plans for their kitchen and bathroom models. In barely a paragraph, we told people so much more about our company with a system like this than I'm an interior designer and now I'm going to do awkward silence. Right? That is a wasted moment in any networking situation, but get really clear on your niche and you have a chance that they'll actually remember meeting you. So for those of you who are on site, this was a slide I tried to describe with my body. And they, what we're trying to remember is you do have a tribe of people and that tribe of people is standing on some pillar of rock in the wilderness and they already know what they're trying to get to, right? So your tribe is someplace and they have this hope, they have this dream in the distance of the kitchen that they want or the bathroom that they want or the new build that they want or the ADU with passive income that they want. They have some idea in mind. We do not have to convince them of that dream. They already want to get there and they don't know how to get there on their own. There are some obstacles in the way and it is a journey of thousands, thousands of decisions. And they also don't know how to keep context in their head so they can make one decision at a time, but they do not know how to make all those decisions in a way that leads to a cohesive outcome, which is one of the main things our clients want, cohesion. So in this journey of a thousand decisions, how am I, the client, going to get from this rock pillar where I'm standing to the castle that I have in, in my sights? And that's where we become the bridge. We are the ones that save them from an arduous journey full of danger. And instead we build them this simple little bridge to get from where they are to where they're trying to go. When you think about it, this is the same thing. This is the same decision you would be making if you were hiring a business coach. Can this person, if I give them my hard earned money, help me get from where I am to where I'm trying to go more quickly, more efficiently than I can on my own. And it's not just a matter of time. It has to be, will they save me from stress? Will they save my relationship? Will they make it easier for my family to navigate this journey? Because 
you're going to hopefully save them more money than you than they pay you. But even if you don't, because that's not necessarily the only way to be of value to them, you will be saving them in all of the other ways, an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of anxiety, an enormous amount of stress and chaos. That's where your value is. You're the bridge. So maybe you're like, Rebecca, all right, I believe you. Niches are important, but won't a niche limit my creativity and growth? And the answer is no. And I know this because I went through this journey, right? I grew from a redesigner and a colorist, that was all I was ever going to offer, into a full kitchen and bath designer. But I would say I never actually changed my niche because what I designed was incidental to the foundation of my niche, which I will clarify in just a minute. Also, I had a micro territory of just nine miles from my office in Green Lake in Seattle. And yet nowadays I have clients all over the world. I have clients in Switzerland and in Finland and in England. And again, that's without really changing my niche because of course, 15 years in business and some of my clients who loved and trusted me moved away and they didn't want to have to redevelop a whole new relationship just with another designer just because they had moved. So I wasn't able to help everybody, especially until I developed virtual services, but they do reach out even if you think they're not going to. So how could I go from being a redesigner and colorist to and, uh, and having a micro territory to being a full home remodeling designer and a, have a, technically a worldwide client base. Well, that's because who I served never changed. I served real people in the non-lux market in homes 3,000 square feet or under. It didn't matter which rooms I was designing, this was my niche. And then the other part of my niche was how I delivered my services. I gave them practical, easy care solutions. That was a, fun, found, a fundamental foundational part of who I am as a designer. I offered flat fee design only services. That didn't change. And I delivered a detailed, fully executable design file. That didn't change. So my niche didn't change, but it also did not limit me. The only thing I had to navigate was as people would bring these kind of out of the norm requests my way, I had to decide, would saying yes to it be a benefit to my company or would it distract me from being good at the things I'm trying to be an expert in? Sometimes that was a yes to the client, sometimes it was a no, and sometimes it was a yes if. Like there's almost always a way I was able to make something a yes, but it's a negotiation. We don't have to take our client's offer at their first offer. Hello slides. Okay. So the next thing you might be wondering is, do I need a hundred thousand or more followers? And again, I can say absolutely not. In fact, Sarah Robertson of Studio Dearborn at our last NKB event showed us that having nearly 400,000 followers does not mean some sort of amazing immediate monetization of your Instagram account. It doesn't work that way. For her to monetize her Instagram account, even at the size it is, takes intention and focus. That means that if that's not part of your career and business goals, you don't have to worry about doing that but you do have to have very clearly defined career and business goals in order to determine strategically if you need to put energy into growing a huge audience, or if you can just focus on developing a loyal fan base. Uh, one of the exercises I use in my Nail Your Niche course, which is actually on the starter kit, is running the math of how many clients you might actually need in your career. It's not as many as you might think. And when we realize that, Frequently, a lot of us can breathe our own sigh of relief and go, okay, I can just basically establish a secondary portfolio on Instagram and not worry so much about gaining followers. But you might be wondering, all right, but I still don't know how to develop a loyal fan base, Rebecca. Well, that's going to start by developing a sigh of relief promise. And this is one of the main things we focus on 
in Nail Your Niche, and then we continue working on and lead to launch. Because we need to make sure that in those first few seconds of when someone lands on our website, that they know they have found their designer, they can stop the scroll, sigh with relief, and start a journey with us. And that means that that sigh of relief promise, ideally, should be right on your homepage above the fold. It should be the first thing they see. Doesn't have to be. Remember, there are no rules. This is just my best advice. And then, like I said, it's those taglines where we usually start seeing the initial seeds of terrible genericness. So let's take a second and elevate those earlier generic taglines because you're gonna see, hopefully, how little it takes to start shaping an actual conversation with your clients instead of a generic, meaningless, white noise conversation, which will go in one ear and out the other. So transforming spaces, elevating lives means very little. But if you were the kind of company you could say this, transforming small spaces, elevating urban lives, now I can start imagining what you do and who you do it for. Two tiny little words. Another example was where dreams meet design. So snoozy. But where get it done dreams meet practical design, now we're having a conversation. Crafting homes and creating memories makes me go, what kind of homes and what kind of memories? But if you were to say crafting multi-generational homes and creating happy family memories, now we're having a conversation. Your vision, our expertise, that could be an insurance company, it could be a car company, it could be anything. But if you say your passive income vision, our ADU and DADU expertise, now we're having a conversation. Ideally, if you tell me your tagline, if you even have one, which I, I encourage, but if you have a tagline, I should immediately start being able to picture the kinds of posts I would expect to see on your Instagram feed. I should immediately start to have a sense of what I should see if I click through to your portfolio. If your tagline isn't generating an instant idea, it could be st even if it's wrong, at least I should get something and not just a blank page when I read it. Last one, designing tomorrow's homes today. Again, doesn't tell me anything. But if you add, so you can stay happy at home in your senior years, now you're talking to a tribe, a tribe that has very specific obstacles, very specific things that are standing between where they are and where they know they want to get to. Remember, your tribe is in one place. They already know they want to be in another place. What they don't know is what it's going to take to get there. You help people create a certain kind of castle. The more clear you can make the kind of castle you build for people, the more often you're going to get to build that exact kind of castle. And remember, when I say castle, we could just be talking about a mudroom or doing a color consult or helping them reorganize their pantry. Anything we do in a, within somebody's home is helping them build the castle they want to live in. And like I said, there is a certain kind of monster that is keeping people in your tribe from completing the quest for their perfect space. And these aren't very complicated obstacles. It's usually something fairly straightforward like time or no talent or a bunch of overwhelm based on where they're at in their lives all the other responsibilities they have, their own background and expertise and talents, what is keeping them from where they're trying to go will vary. And you want to align what you do and who you do it for so that those things go together naturally. But you might be wondering why they should trust you because trust is obviously one of the most important things we have to build with our clients as interior designers. And the reason that they're going to be able to trust you long before they meet you is because that sigh of relief promise 
is then going to be reinforced by the talent and proof that they see in your portfolio. And then it's going to be reinforced by your process and deliverables as spelled out in your services, a process and deliverables that gives them the promise you made in your sigh of relief. It's going to be backed up by your background, that cool, juicy background in couples counseling or whatever. It's going to be on your about page so that they can see in black and white why you're good at what you do. Your expertise is then going to be shown off through your blogs if you choose to write one or what you post on your social feed so they can see a consistency in your message and that builds trust. And of course, if you're in my lead to launch program, you're going to make sure that you have very niche focused questions throughout your intake form so that as they're filling out your intake form, you're not only getting incredible information that you need in order to say yes to the project, but you're building their trust that you can do what they need because of the kinds of questions you ask. A well-developed website makes it exceptionally clear what you do, who you do it for, and what people are going to get if they hire you. And while the Lead to Launch course is not a website design course, it goes deep into how are we communicating what we're communicating. Because if they can't understand it from your website, you're starting behind the game. You've just made it so much harder because now it's entirely on your shoulders to explain everything they need to know through maybe a discovery call and then hopefully your initial consultation. And especially if all of that is verbal, they're going to lose so much of that information. So you have to get clear on what you do and who you do it for, etc. And then you have to communicate that through your messaging. If you do that, it will build trust in your client before they even meet you. And what's so cool about that is that then your conversation at your initial consult is more productive. You're not having to re-explain things. You're just making sure that they understood everything. And the really great part is that once you launch, <clears throat> once you launch the project with them after they've signed your design agreement, once you've actually started, because they have more trust in your process, they, they make bolder decisions. They make the kinds of decisions we want our clients to make. Because the thing is, if they don't trust you, then they don't feel safe and secure. And none of us make bold choices. None of us take risks when we don't feel safe and secure. We make safe choices when we don't feel secure. So if you have been craving having clients who will let you be a bit more bold, look at your intake process to make sure that you're establishing an incredible foundation of trust because otherwise you're fighting an uphill battle. So at the end of all of that, my question to you now would be, if we were to go to your website and your social feed, do they represent your unique design point of view? That's your design philosophy. Do they reflect your design process point of view, which is how you're going to take them from where they are to where you're going to lead them to? And does it reflect your aesthetic point of view? And if you were to show those to the person standing next to you, if we were still at the live event, could they confidently tell me what you do? Because it doesn't, I mean, yes, it totally matters if you can explain your own services. Obviously, that's very important. But if only you understand them, especially after having read through your site or social feed, then they are not clear enough. So if you want to be known as an expert, you have to have something to say. And you can't just have something to say, then you have to say it and you have to say it a lot. So when I work with my clients, sometimes my designer clients, sometimes I find that they actually do have this incredible defined niche, but they haven't been able to articulate it. So it's not just enough to define your niche. You then have to 
promote your niche so that people know that you have the solution that they've been looking for. And you have to do it so many times that you're probably going to get a little bored of your own message. That is a good sign. It means you have just barely started saying it enough for people to actually pick up on what you're saying. All right, Rebecca, you say, but what am I supposed to say? Well, the cool thing is there is no limit to ideas. So here is a short list of ideas that no matter what your niche is, you could talk about. Products you source or brands that you trust and why. And then you can tag those brands in your Instagram posts, which someday could even lead to some sort of a brand collaboration. Who knows? Construction challenges that are unique to your market. My favorite example is that one of my designers works exclusively in the downtown quarter in Seattle. And that obviously and therefore involves a lot of high rise condominium buildings and remodeling in a high rise condominium building is not straightforward. So by addressing the construction challenges unique to her market in condos, she's elevating her expertise because people can tell she knows what she's talking about and establishing what her expertise is so that when people want to remodel a condo in downtown Seattle, she's the one that shows up thanks to the SEO that Google has now given her based on being so clear about who she helps and how she helps them. You could talk about colors that work with your aesthetic point of view or your geography. Geography is an interesting thing to lean into. People love hiring local experts. So try to show your local expertise. For example, in Seattle, I could say three grays you should never use in Seattle. Now, never is a hard word or a harsh word, but when marketing, getting clearer with our points of view tends to work better. The point is, you can use your geography to shape a specific conversation. Care of common products in your niche. This is especially important if you're in the luxury market because most of the things you source need unique care. And so if you talk about how to take care of a living finish, for example, you're sending very specific messages about what you do and who you do it for. It also gives you an opportunity to call out local folks like carpet cleaners or window treatment cleaners who deal with these kinds of specialty products so that you are giving your clients resources to take care of the things that you're helping them create in the first place. Completed or in process projects and niche aligned choices that, that show how you cater to your tribe's needs. So a lot of us are already showing pictures of our completed work but we're trying to let the picture do all the heavy lifting and that's okay, but it's kind of a missed opportunity to shape a conversation. So if you post a picture, what is it you want them to take away from that picture? If you want them to notice how you used a triadic color scheme and why that worked so well in the space, talk about it. If you want them to notice how you solved a pinch point in the kitchen where the family was arguing every Thursday, because that's when everybody had to leave the house at the same time, talk about it. Do not assume that your clients can connect the dots for themselves. <laughs> and local artisans and craftspeople whose work complements your design. Another great opportunity to tag members of your community build relationships and build trust with your partners. Oh, and also say a lot about what you do and who you do it for, because obviously the artisans and crafts people you're highlighting should say something, should signal something about what you do and who you do it for. So in the description of this webinar or workshop or whatever we want to call it, um, I promise to give you all some homework. But before I give you that homework, I want to share one more happy reminder for anyone that is still worried that niches limit us. And that is this. A niche is just the front door to your design house. It does not mean you can't do other things. It just means you shouldn't be marketing for other things. Because honestly, I find that even the designers that I work with that have a really well-defined niche, their marketing is still frequently surprisingly generic because they are so afraid of scaring off potential clients. 
And that means they fall into the generalist trap. That means that all of their messaging is so generic that it gets lost in the sea of white noise because people get so many messages, marketing messages every single day. So your marketing message is simply a compelling, beautiful front entry door that invites people into your design house. Once they're in that easy access point, it's fine to introduce them to all the rooms in your beautiful design mansion, but don't confuse them before they even get in the front door. So today's key takeaways before I go to that homework are Number one, we all, I believe, have a design point of view, a design process point of view, and an aesthetic point of view. The key is having the courage to embrace it. Number two, the generalist trap usually keeps us from being perceived or paid as experts, so we should try and stay out of it. Number three, a niche isn't about convincing anyone to want what you've got. It's about finding people who already want what you've got and need your help getting it. And number four, a profitable niche doesn't require 100,000 followers, but it does require developing a confident sigh of relief message that's reinforced throughout your website and your social feed. So the homework. I find that we are, most of us, way too close to our own businesses to be able to effectively audit our own work, which is why sometimes people hire me to do that. So instead, I want you to audit a colleague's work, okay? How did the designers you admire market their services and show off their expertise? So audit a colleague's site. Ideally, this is somebody that you admire, that you emulate, that you wish you would be, because that will give you some signals as to what you do and don't want to do. But alternatively, it can be very powerful to audit the site of somebody you definitely don't want to be, look at their signals and learn what you don't want to do. Either way, this is a really great exercise to do with a friend. Not that you're auditing each other's sites, because that can get kind of complicated, but you're auditing the same sites and comparing notes about what you took away and what you perceived and why you perceived it. So what you're going to do is you're going to audit your colleague's site based on what I call the five distinguishers. These are the five things that we should be using to distinguish ourselves at minimum. And sadly, it is amazing how often I audit a designer's site and cannot answer some of these questions or find that I'm getting conflicting answers to some of these questions. So you're going to audit their geography. Can you tell where they work? Do they serve a micro, a local, a regional, or a virtual territory? Their personality. What are three to five words you would use to describe the personality of the designer or design team and why? Because there, people aren't usually saying, I'm an X, Y, and Z designer. So there's something that you're reading between the lines that is telling you something about their personality through the fonts, through the colors, through the words that they use. Their luxury level. Is the firm targeting the mid-market or the luxe market when it comes to their clients? And how do you know? Number four, their service structure. How many services do they offer? What specifically is the outcome of buying that service? What is included? What isn't included in each service? And how are the services priced? Now, a lot of the sites you're going to look at are going to have very mushy services that are kind of slippery to understand, and they're going to have zero price signaling. I like price signaling. I do not want to spend my time with a client if they cannot afford my services. I don't want to do that to myself, wasting my time, and I don't want to do that to them. So I am a big advocate of price signaling, and it's a huge part of what we talk about in the Lead to Launch course. As you audit your colleague's site, evaluate if you can get a sense of their prices and how you feel based on what you're able to tell from auditing the site. And finally, their aesthetic point of view, the one thing people think actually defines a niche, it is important, so take a look. Do they have a recognizable aesthetic? What seems to be consistent across all their designs? How does the aesthetic design of the website reflect reinforce or conflict with the aesthetic that you see in their portfolio pictures.
One of the things that I like to point out when I'm at any kind of a networking event is that we have three kinds of colleagues in the room with us. We have doppelgangers, the people that are basically our twins. We have referral partners and we have specialists. And I like to bring this up at a live event because we're supposed to be networking, but it's really hard to know how to network. Like, how are we supposed to make use of that time when obviously it's not like it's a room full of our clients. These are our colleagues. They want clients too. Well, if you start asking people when you're at these kinds of events about their geography, about their personality, their luxury level, their service structure, and their aesthetic point of view, you can start putting your colleagues into these categories. Your doppelgangers are the kinds of people that you would refer if you went on your like six month honeymoon or maternity leave or you retired. It's really good to have a couple of trusted colleagues in your pocket for when you simply cannot take on the kinds of clients you best serve. Then you're going to have your referral partners. These are people that do something completely different from you or serve an entirely different market than you. That's when you can be, that's when you have to level up your skills at saying no, another one of the modules in the lead, lead to launch course. And it is so much easier to say no to certain clients if you've got a good resource for them to go to instead of you. And then you've got your specialists. Specialists are people that you're going to bring in on a project when you need a specialist. For me, that usually looked like either a closet designer or a window treatment specialist because those are specialties that I felt were best served by people who really understood the industry in that narrow view. So as you're networking, think about what kinds of colleagues you're meeting because it will make your networking go better. And the way to do that, in case you're wondering, but Rebecca, how can we tell who's who? It's coming through everything we're talking about right now. Ask them what they do, who they do it for, and what folks will get if they hire them. This is not only a great way for you to vet your colleagues and figure out how you guys can work together, but it is a gift to your colleague because very few, uh, very few of us get the opportunity to practice describing what we do and who we do it for, except in those high stakes moments where we're actually meeting with a client. And we don't want to get that wrong. So networking events are this wonderful opportunity where we can give each other the gift of describing what we do and who we do it for and what folks get if they hire us in a time where the stakes are much lower. And of course, you want to commit to having those answers ready for yourself too. That would actually be the main point, because if you do ask people these insightful questions, they're probably going to turn around and ask you the same question, giving you the opportunity to practice your elevator speech. So the takeaway, nail your niche. You will get more and better clients. I promise. And by the way, in case anybody is wondering, the next Nail Your Niche two-week intensive starts in April. Just let me know if you'd like the details on that. If you'd like to get started nailing your niche, uh, you can't win the free one-to-one -one business coaching session with me because you're watching this on the replay. But if you email me with your favorite aha moment, I would be delighted to send you the starter kit that I have on nailing your niche. That is all my slides. Normally I would open this up to Q&A now, but obviously we are not live and together. So for those of you who are there, thank you to NKBA for hosting me. Thank you. And to Cosentino for being the sponsor for the entire event. Thank you. I look forward to seeing y'all in the next webinar or wherever our paths cross. Bye for now.